Today I'd like to talk about numerical methods of integration. The premise is we want to calculate some integral from a to b of f of x dx, but we've got a problem. Even though the f might be some perfectly nice function, that is to say continuous or differentiable or even has several continuous derivatives, Unfortunately, we don't know an antiderivative for the f function. This means we can't use the standard antiderivative trick. We'll have to come up with some other idea. Our general setup will be as usual. I'm going to take the interval from a to b, which I will call x0 on one end and xn on the other, split it up into n equal sized subintervals. I'll call the width of these delta x number i, which for our case, all of the delta x's will be the same width, b minus a over n. x number i, as usual, is the left end x value, that is to say a, plus i times the spacing delta x. This is going to be true for i equals 0 through n. In the pictures which I'll draw, I'm going to pretend that the function takes on positive values so that the graph is above the x-axis. This allows me to think about integrals in terms of areas. This is not necessary, it's just a convenient thing. If we look at chunk number i, which ends at xi and begins at xi number 1, we have a flat line across the bottom, two flat lines, and a curved shape above. The idea for the trapezoid rule approximation is this. I'm going to think of taking the straight line that connects the two ends and building a trapezoidal shape out of it. Then I'm going to approximate the integral over this one chunk by the integral of this straight line function. We know how to calculate the area of a shape like that though from geometry. It's one half times the height at one side plus the height at the second side times the length of the base. So the contribution to my integral that comes from chunk number i is just going to be this amount. Now to see the general pattern of this, I'm going to write out this trapezoid approximation using four subintervals. The first subinterval will contribute delta x over 3 times f at x0 plus f at x1. The second subinterval begins at x1 and ends at x2, so the contribution I'll get from it is delta x over 2 times f at x1 plus f of x2. Likewise, we can write down formulas for the contribution to the integral that comes from the third and fourth subintervals. If you'll notice, there's a delta x over 2 in each one of these contributions. So the first simplification, we'll just factor the delta x over 2 out. Having done that, we can make an observation. The symbol x0 only shows up once. That's going to be f evaluated at a. The symbol f of x number 4 only shows up once. That's going to be f of b. And everything else, f at x1 shows up twice, so does f of x2, so does f of x3. So if you wanted to be clever about this, you could write this as delta x over 2 times the function value at one end plus the function value at the other end. I might as well group those together plus I will add up all the other f values and then multiply that by 2. This is called the composite trapezoid rule. 
As an example of this, I'm going to estimate the integral from 1 to 2 of 1 over x dx, whose exact value is natural log of 2, or in decimal, this number. I want to write out all digits of all quantities that I calculate because at the end I want to compare the accuracy of my trapezoid method against what the actual value is. So delta x is the width of the interval, which is 2 minus 1, which is 1, divided by the number of subintervals. Delta x is going to be 1 fourth. Now, x0 is 1, which is 4 over 4. x1 is delta x bigger than that, which is 5 over 4. x2 is 6 over 4. x3 is 7 over 4. And x number 4 is 8 divided by 4, which is 2, of course. The function that we're dealing with is f of x equals 1 over x. So the function values that I need to use are simply the reciprocals of the x quantities. So we'll have 4 over 4, 4 over 5, 4 over 6, 4 over 7, and 4 over 8, which is 1 half again. What we're going to do is I'm going to take delta x and divide it by 2. That would be 1 fourth divided by 2, which is 1 eighth. I've got to write down f at x0, that would be 4 over 4, which is 1, plus f at the end, which is 4 over 8, which I'll just go ahead and write as 1 half, plus I add together the function values at x1, x2, and x3, and having added those up, I double the result. I did this work on my calculator, keeping all digits, and the result was 0 0.69702380095. I said earlier that the exact value of this integral is natural log of 2, which, if you evaluate that on your, on your calculator, turns out to be 0 0.69314718060. We've done a relatively small amount of work here, and we've got two significant figures done. So that's not bad at all. The second idea that I want to look at is called Simpson's Rule. Rather than using a single subinterval of width delta x, we'll use two of them. So I'm going to have x number 2i x number 2i minus 1, and x number 2i minus 2. For convenience, I'm, for a while, going to call these x values a, b, and c. The idea in Simpson's rule is to fit a parabola through the data points that go with the x values that I have, a, b, and c. I want to find a quadratic function whose graph passes through a comma f of a, b comma f of b, and c comma f of c. Rather than using a trapezoid to approximate my function on a single subinterval, I'll use a parabola to approximate it on a pair of adjacent subintervals. It turns out that the quadratic polynomial that I need is p of x equals f of a plus this fraction times x minus a plus this other fraction times x minus a times x minus b. If you're wondering where I got that formula from, take Math 4670, Numerical Methods, and I'll tell you all about that. As it stands, we'll just do a sanity check. This is obviously a quadratic polynomial in terms of the x. If you evaluate it at x equal a, then this entire piece is 0 because of a minus a. This entire piece is 0 for the same reason. p evaluated at a is f evaluated at a, just as it's supposed to be. 
If you evaluate at x equal b, life is a little bit more complicated. This last chunk still goes away because of b minus b. This piece, you'll have a factor of b minus a, which is delta x. You've got a delta x downstairs, so the delta x's will cancel out. You're left with f of a plus the top of this fraction, which is f of b minus f of a. The f of a's cancel out, and you get f of b as you're supposed to. Unfortunately, when we check the third point, the x equals c, no such nice thing happens. c minus a is 2 times delta x. c minus a is 2 times delta x. c minus b is delta x. And it's very messy looking, so we'll have to do some algebra to simplify this. Having canceled out all of the delta x's that will cancel out, we end up with f of a plus 2f of b minus 2f of a plus f of c minus 2f of b plus f of a, which is not very encouraging looking, until you realize that the 2f of b minus 2f of b cancels out f of a plus f of a is 2 times f of a, which then gets subtracted away, so those cancel out, and the only thing that remains is f of c. So even though it may be a mystery as to how I got my hands on that polynomial, it is the correct polynomial, the one that I'm looking for. It's a quadratic polynomial that passes through my three points. So, having figured that out, I'm going to approximate the integral from a to c of f of x dx by the integral from a to c of the quadratic that we just figured out. Actually doing the integrals is straightforward but extremely tedious, so in the sake of brevity, I'm just going to state the result. When I integrate p of x, from a to c. When the dust finally settles, you get delta x over 3 multiplied by the quantity f of a plus 4f of b plus f of c. Two things to take note of. In each double wide interval, the contribution is going to have a factor of delta x over 3. The function value at the ends, the a, and the c show up one time, and then in the middle you have four times the function value of the x value in the middle. I want to do as with the trapezoid rule and figure out what the pattern is. Because I need a collection of double wide intervals, n has to be even. If I look at n equal 4, there's not enough information in it to really impress upon us the pattern. So I'm going to look at n equals 6. So I'll have x0, x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, and x6. And I'm going to split this up into three double wide intervals. The first one involves x0, x1, and x2 x0 and x2 will be the points at the ends, while x1 is the point in the middle. Likewise, in the second chunk, x2 and x4 are the beginning and end, and x3 is in the middle. And here, x4 and x6 are the ends of the thing, and x5 is the middle of it. So, if you do as we said we're going to, I've got three of these parabolas. The contribution from the first one is delta x over 3 times the function at the left end, function at the right end, and 4 times the function value in the middle. The contribution from the second double wide integral is delta x over 3 times function value at the beginning, function value at the end, 4 times the function value in the middle, 
and then the third one you follow that exact same pattern. Obviously every contribution is going to have a delta x over 3 as a factor so we will factor that out. f at x 0 the symbol f of x 0 only shows up once in the entire proceeding. f of x 6 only shows up once. f of x 1 f of x3, f of x5 all show up once, but they get multiplied by this number 4. And also, if you look at the remaining values, f of x2 plus f of x2, that shows up twice. f of x4 plus f of x4, that shows up twice as well. So obviously, we're going to have some function values which have coefficients 1, some that have coefficients 4, and some that have coefficients 2 here because of the f of x2 plus f of x2 business. So if we have any sense, we will group similar terms together. So my Simpson's rule approximation is going to be delta x over 3 multiplied by function value at the ends added together plus 4 times f of x1 plus f of x3 plus f of x5 plus 2 times f at x2 plus f at x4. If you're looking for patterns, this is delta x over 3 times the sum of the function values at the end plus 4 times the sum of the function values that go with x numbers that have an odd index plus 2 times the sum of the function values that have an index that's even except you omit 0 or n because those function values have already been accounted for. This time, delta x is the width of the interval, 2 minus 1, divided by 6, n is 6 here. But otherwise, we do very similarly to before. We figure out what the x numbers involved are. The function value, f of x here is 1 over x, so the function values are just the reciprocals of the x values. I'll have delta x over 3, that's 1 sixth divided by 3, which is 1 divided by 18. The function value at the left end is 6 over 6. The function at the right end is 6 over 12. I might as well go ahead and add those together as 1.5. Then I have to take the function values with odd indexes, add them together, and multiply that by 4. The result is 8.277056277. Again, I'm writing down all digits because I want to compare my result against the actual answer. The function values that have even indexes but are not index 0 or 6 are 6 over 8, 6 over 10. Add those together, multiply by 2 to get 2.7. Do the arithmetic on a calculator using n equals 6 for the integral from 1 to 2, 1 over x dx. Simpson's rule produces 0 0.6391697932. According to my calculator, the exact value of natural log 2 is 0.69314718060. Really, this was not terribly more complicated than doing the trapezoid rule, but instead of only getting two digits correct, we now get four. Usually, Simpson's rule gives a better answer than the trapezoid rule. A reasonable person is thinking, then why bother with the trapezoid rule? That answer comes in two parts. Number one, it's an easy introduction trapezoids are easy to think about. But number two, 
you can do something with the trapezoid rule, which you can't do with Simpson's rule. Our introductory calculus class is not the appropriate place to talk about that, though. If you want more details, take Math 4670, Numerical Methods. This is all I wanted to talk about today. You shouldn't take this particular section too seriously. We will have other ways of doing things as we go along. But if we get stuck and we can't see anything else to do to evaluate a numerical integral, I might haul out Simpson's rule or something. More likely, I would write a program to do this automatically. The details are not appropriate at this time, though. We've been snowed in once again. I hope everybody's safe, and hopefully I'll see you again soon.